Hello fellow bassists, bass guitarists and bass players. This week's interview is with Andrea Goldsworthy who currently plays for Paloma Faith amongst many other people. We met many years ago and I interviewed her for Bass Guitar Magazine. It was such a great time doing the interview and then doing a photo shoot. I really wanted to interview her for my Bassman Jack project. This interview was so much fun to do. Uh, I got to meet her dog Rocky and on top of that, uh, she's got some st great stories about playing for Mark Ronson and the likes, Ladytron, etc. Um, so listen through to the end. It's a really insightful interview and there's loads of funny bits in there. Um, I hope you enjoy it. As per usual, give my Instagram a follow please and also go over to YouTube and like and subscribe my content and click on the bell at the top for uh, notifications of when I'm posting a new video. Enjoy. <laughs> I'm Andrea Goldsworthy, I'm a bass player with primarily Paloma Faith, um, but also I've done lots of other things for other people. At the minute I'm kind of doing a lot of um, functions, which is, is good as a musician. Uh, we go out as uh, Faith Et, so it's Paloma's live band. Um, and the three singers then become, the backing singers become the main singers. So that's, that's a nice little way of, of kind of continuing playing. It came about after the last album campaign with Paloma, so her third album. We kind of realised that we wouldn't, you know, it was at like the last kind of few gigs. Uh, she was going to go off, have a baby and we just, and, and write the next album. We were like, we're not going to get to play at all and what, what are you up to and it's like that and we just thought why don't we make a function band and then we can carry on and then that kind of took off and was really successful then when Paloma came out with her last uh, album kind of put a hold on that but it was it was really good because we when we kind of went back into rehearsals to get the you know for the get everything up to scratch for the tour. It was like we hadn't stopped playing because we hadn't. So it, 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 before it, it was, it took a little while to kind of gel back together. But obviously, because we play all the time, you know, it kind of clicked instantly, basically, because you know we are a band. This year, a few highlights. Um, so I played on Frank Turner's album. Um, played some double bass for his latest album. No Man's Land. Um, that was really cool. It's an album that he wrote about various kind of lesser known women uh, from various points in history. So, for example, it's the, you know, the witch from Camden uh, in the 1600s and ve various people. It's, re it's a really good album. And then he kind of had the idea, let's get all women to play on the album and then female producer and and so yeah I did that that was really good another highlight played was Mark Ronson on the Jonathan Ross show <laughs> name dropping yes that was that's my the biggest thud that uh, I'm gonna do name drop wise but um yeah that was that was amazing obviously I kind of got when I got the call I kind of didn't realize that much at the time it was like oh cool Mark Ronson let's listen to the song oh great yeah great song banging bass line like this is really good and then there was some point you're just like oh yeah that Mark Ronson who's done all of these th amazing things so yeah it's been 11 years veteran <laughs> it's amazing so this year actually last month was the 10th anniversary of her first album do you want the truth or something beautiful but obviously before that i actually i met her in may 2008 um that was our first gig i can't remember the name of the venue i've changed it loads of times but it's in west london anyway, and we had about four or five gigs that year like hoxton bar and kitchen now colors hoxton just a festival in jersey like i think she was it was kind of before she was signed, then she got signed, and then, of course, that then by 2009, things were obviously all taken off. But yeah, so it's 11 years. There's me and uh, one of the singer, uh, backing singers, uh, Miss Baby Soul. She joined, I think, 2009. So we are the, yeah, the veterans. The initial stuff that she did was a lot more, um, I guess, a bit, a bit more kind of um, a bit jazzier. It's kind of a bit more niche, as in a lot of songs sounded a bit like there was a very like retroy kind of uh, 
feel to a lot of it. And then the first album, although I think that still got, does continue through a lot of it, but obviously there's more of a kind of like mega pop aspect to it now. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think the second album was definitely more kind of electronic. Um, I was on for that, all of that, those tours. It was like, I think I only played bass in like about three or four songs and the rest was all on Moog, which is great. Yeah, Moog Voyager, amazing synth. And yeah, then the third album was a lot more kind of soul and funky. Like we, there was a brass section then for that tour. I really enjoyed that in terms of electric playing because a lot of those songs, it's just a lot more, still playing the Moog as well, but a lot, a lot more kind of, you know, of that kind of funkier bass lines, which is my kind of preferred uh, <laughs> style. And then the last album, mixture of all of them, really. I think kind of baseline wise, the last two albums have more have been much more kind of involved for me, which I like, like more of a challenge. Like the second album, a lot of the mood playing, I understand and I'm, you know, it's not for, it, it was just a lot of kind of one, <laughs> like carry on, you know, it wasn't, which is fine and it's what the music needed. But not necessarily. I, I prefer to a little more involved. But you know, but I will of course do whatever's required. Being a professional, yeah. So that's. I think it's. Yeah, it's become more. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's my confidence as well. I, I think. I think I've obviously grown a lot in confidence over the last kind of eleven years. Not. Not that I ever wasn't confident, but I think I've got more confident actually at playing less. Having said all that about, you know, I don't want to. You know, it's a bit, it is a li it's not as fun to play single notes on a keyboard uh, <laughs> than it is, to, you know, uh, something more involved. Say, yeah, 10 years ago, I would have had this minor anxiety running that, oh my God, this is, oh God, this is, this is, you know, I should be doing something else. Maybe let's make it a little bit more complicated and, you know, an event, and, and then that wouldn't work. And then you'd eventually just, just stick to whatever that possibly simple line was but then yeah I'd feel a little bit anxious that perhaps I, it wasn't enough whereas now I think I've got more com, com maybe I'm just lazy I don't know no it's it, it is about it's kind of knowing when to stop playing as well as playing and knowing where the gaps are and and not overplaying now I didn't ever really overplay but I wanted to and now I don't <laughs> so yeah It's interesting. It's like the um, um, with the Mark Ronson thing. I think there was one point where he said, like, um, oh, I think he could afford, like, really great. I think he could afford to just sit back on the chorus and something like that. Like, I remember early on, if you know, if people with MD or producer or whatever hits anyone would say things immediately, I'd just be like, <gasps> like almost in this kind of panic. That's like, oh God, right? I'm what have I done in it? And whereas that was like, oh yeah, of course, I know exactly, because the verse was quite laid back and then the bridge actually picks up and then the chorus kind of returns back to the verse. But of course the bridge is picking up and then I'm still kind of a bit ahead in the chorus. Totally made sense, fine, yeah, of course, I can do that without having like a, in, you know, internal meltdown. And it's, I think that's the difference now as well. It's having, it's, it's t it like understand what they're saying and then, you know, and then just doing it. That's fine. I've had a long, I, I know that it, it happens sometimes. I like the tone pretty much all the way rolled off on the bass. I like that sound. And there's been a few sound engineers over the years that have been like, can you roll the tone, like put all the tone on, like one, one sound engineer made me change my strings. Yeah, right? My lovely old strings, I, you know, let's, Bernard Edwards mentioned that point where I think he was in an interview and said, they were like, what strings do you use? And it was, I don't know if this happened, but the story is that he was like, Niall, what, what strings came with this bass? It's like, that's, so anyway, that was it. But so it made me change the strings. I had to, my in-ear mix had to be like completely EQ'd so that, cause it just sounded like, hell like zingy hell um but anyway so uh mark ronson was like hey andy if you um where's the tone on your bass i was like a little bit on he was like all the way off i was like can do <laughs> yes <laughs> so that was again like as if i didn't respect him enough you know 
the way Paloma works is that she'll write with a lot of different other writers, like Diane Warren in LA, or, you know, whoever it may be, you know, she put Pharrell on the album before. And understandably, you know, they don't, you know, the record company aren't going to fly the band out. Just they're going to use whoever that they have out there or, or, you know, whoever the songwriter has. So that, yeah, so that happens a lot, but that's fine. I kind of, um, yeah, I understand that. I'm not offended. <laughs> when, you know, whenever it's something that's like in, you know, local, then she'll use the whole band, you know, whenever she can. Like everything else live and you know, she's Paloma's really kind of loyal about her band and wants to keep the same band, and everything just feels very kind of kind of family orientated. There's just a, it's just a really nice kind of environment to to be in. You know, before she had a child, we kind of everyone everyone in the band who didn't have children all went on holiday to Mexico <laughs> together, like with partners and. But, you know, that the point is that we are kind of, you know, it's a band and we are all good friends, you know, so it's a, which is a real, a real kind of joy to be around, you know. The Frank Turner thing, playing on his album was, was really, really great. It was nice to do some double bass as well, because um, I was playing double bass on the, th the so the previous album, but on the last album, it was just all electric. So it's nice to kind of get that kind of going as well. I've been doing much more, like a lot of the functions I'm doing recently as well are all on electric. So I need to, I want to kind of keep my hand in. I've got an originals project called Port Noise Complaint, as in, I, I didn't know, see, we came up with the name. Um, someone had seen the film uh, and, and just said, I, I, they, I like the sound of that for, for a name. And I hadn't heard of the book or the film. Um, and so when they said it, I just saw the three separate words as port noise complaint. Obviously it's spelt differently um, in the book. Uh, and also I didn't know what it was, none of the band knew what it was about either. So we just, <laughs> um, anyone who doesn't know can Google it. Uh, but anyway, we kind of, we kept to the name, which I, th I still think is a nice name. So it's me and double bass. We've got Adrian Cox, my boyfriend, on clarinet and sax and singing. The Paloma guitarist, Sam Lewis, uh, Joe Webb, piano, uh, Gethin Jones on drums. And lead vocalist is Sam Lewis's dad, Dave Eaton. Kind of started just saying, oh, let's have a jam, because everyone obviously writes and plays music. Dave used to, well, still does kind of be busking and does gigs with Sam and everyone in the band had seen him around. And then he came to a gig and anyway, we got talking, it was like, oh, it'd be good to have a jam, like, with you. Like, and we, so we just started, like, just doing some Tom Waits covers. He's written some songs, Sam written some songs, Adrian's written some songs, we've all written songs. So then we kind of started doing, like, bringing all those together. So then we've recorded an album and that's all very nice and very fun. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of, that's one of the good things, I think, was having lots of regular kind of function gigs when when I'm not touring it's kind of you have all the things like faith ets to kind of keep things ticking along and then you can focus on like doing original stuff which isn't always the most profitable and can be quite expensive yeah so portnoisecomplaint.com I had like a few kind of piano lessons um that I was not, I mean, I was all right. Had my like cousin's Bon Tempe organ, like, cause she was 10 years older than me. And like, she'd given me that. And he, when I was a kid, I'd like, I'd play, like work out theme tunes from like cartoons or whatever. Loved the recorder. I loved the recorder. Um, anyway, <laughs> yeah. So I had a few piano, piano lessons and then got into like Nirvana and The Cure and, and all that kind of, you know, music that was around at the time and it was just like I want to play guitar and uh, I'd kind of mentioned it my dad had like an acoustic Spanish guitar that he, he'd never been able to play he had had it since he was a kid so I was kind of mucking around on that and then I was like oh, I'd really like an electric guitar and he my dad came home from work um so I've got you an electric guitar like he's like well someone I worked with he, he just had it and uh, he, he, 
I mentioned that you wanted one, so here you go. Like, and it was a bass. And I was like, oh, OK, yeah, I'll give this a go. Yeah, it was a like, proper kind of Frankenstein. So, that someone had tried to make it fretless, and so they're, like, after the 12th fret or 13th fret, I can't remember, there was, there's, there's no frets, but they hadn't been filled in either. Like, the string tree looked like a, some bit of plumbing equipment. <laughs> I don't know. It was really massive, like, metal pickups as well. But uh, anyway, that... That I, I kind of had a few lessons from my friend and the first thing I learned was Wild Thing, I believe, um, which was really closely related to Babes in Toyland. He's my thing. Anyway, yeah, so that... And then I also... My friend who played guitar, I kind of started to... I, I then borrowed an electric off him and was kind of learning both at the same time. But I was like, this is... I just prefer... I just loved the feel of bass. I loved the... The, I don't know, just that ability to dig in and, and I found, I just found the, the bass compared to guitar lines just so much more satisfying. Even though I think beyond, like in stuff like Nirvana, that kind of like really crunchy thing. I, I don't know, it always, I just always felt like it, it, it was too, the strings are too delicate on the guitar. And I, I just, even though you're like really, it just, I just like to dig in, I think. So again, that's why, yeah. That was the thing with, with bass. And then, so I played a good few years with local bands in my hometown, Lowestoft. And Acid Jazz came to to, uh, to town and I started getting really into that. By this point, I'd kind of, I could play not, not great, but I could play. So that was really good to get into all of that stuff. So it's bands like Corduroy and, and like all of that. And then, of course, band, uh, mates who who's had like, you know, amazing record collections be like oh you like this you like corduroy Can't listen to this curtis mayfield and then you're like oh right this is so then that whole world it, it opened up funkadelic and parliament and then that was like this is amazing this is why bass was this is what it's meant for so yeah getting into all of that music and then again which that that made me a much kind of you know better player in terms of you know there's more more of a kind of style and gradually getting into more complicated stuff and um then yeah moved to london basically i had a gap year in mexico where I was going to study like psychology and I got into loads of good um, universities and then had like a bit of a, not gap year, just a bit of an adventure for about six months in Mexico. Whilst I was there, everywhere that that me and my friend went, we, we'd kind of meet musicians and, and that. I just realised that that's what I wanted to do. And, and I remember saying, I, I was talking to someone in Mexico and they were like, you have to follow your passion. You have to follow your feelings. You must do music. You cannot do anything else. And I was like, oh, this is right. This is it. This is right. So I got back and like went back to Bird's Eye packing waffles, which is what I'd done before going there to get the money together to go. Yeah, and told my, my mum and dad and, and my dad was like, Music? What the fuck are you going to do with music? And I say, well, what am I going to do with psychology, really? Like, I'm just certainly was like, and my mum was like, oh, you could, she could be a music journalist if it all goes wrong. And I was like, and anyway, and he was like, eventually he was like, no, I don't, you know, I don't care. You could work at Bernard Matthews, as, you know, for all I care, as long as you're... Is, you know, basically as long as you're happy. So, so then this whole year I kind of got into like music colleges because as well it was quite, it was quite difficult for me. But I could read music but I wasn't used to reading for bass so I had to kind of go back and then get my kind of grade eight as well to get enough skills to get into music college in that kind of formal way. But I just, I just wanted, I wanted some, I wasn't brave enough to move to London without going to college and I did I did want I did somewhere in I wanted to get a degree of some description um so yeah so that but and then really after after music college I had like sort of original band that we were trying to kind of make it but didn't because we were all young dickheads <laughs> basically bunch of idiots um uh yeah um <laughs> Uh, not everyone. There was there was quite a few in the band. Um, I, I include myself in that. I was living in Camden then, and yeah, so really trying lots of different things. And I I kind of did. I started to work for the Camden New Journal tonight in uh, just to in their advertising department, just to kind of get something else. Because I started to think, ah, oh, this is probably not going to happen now. So I do need to 
do something else. And then like Friday night down the good mix of pub, like someone was going around scouting for people to be in the latest gold frat video. They were like, I know they, 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 oh, there needs to be like male kind of indie boys. And I was like, are they looking for, would they be up for a female? And she was like, why not? Just come and audition. I was like, great. So went to like, this office to audition. There's, I had to mime guitar, basically, miming guitar. So like, introduce yourself. I was like, hi, my name's Andrea. Um, I play bass and guitar. Um, and anyway, and so I mimed in this video, like along to the song, just miming in an office. And I didn't get the, didn't get that. Then the manager of Goldfrap also managed Lady Tron, and he called me up um, about a month later, going, hi. Um, you look like you can play the bass. Uh, can you actually play the bass? Because you were miming. I was like, I could definitely play. He's like, right, okay. So Lady Tron are looking for a new bass player for their tours and, um, you know, for all live stuff. Would you like to audition? Yes, please. It was like, this was 2005. So it was CD through the post. It was like eagerly awaited the, um, that. And then I basically sat down. It was their live show. I sat down and, like, just learnt it and then just played it like for hours and hours after learning it and then played it again and again and again like obsessional um I only had two days but that I so and then I went to the audition got that so I was touring with them for best part of two years then they took a break to write a new album then um I did a little few bits and pieces with Kate Nash, did a bit, um, that was the end of 2007. I did Jules Holland with her, that was excellent. That was my first TV, kind of big TV break. My dad was in the pub on the, on New Year's Eve. She was on the show, on Hootenanny, so, um, and I was doing like the last song with her. So the first song that they did, obviously my dad's watching in, down the pub and he's like, Andrea, they've cut you off. They've cut you off. What's go that you're not in it, and I was like, no, 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 I'm in the next one. He's like, oh, all right, right, see you later, bye. And then, <laughs> and then uh, it was really good because apparently he was like, I, I, this is one. I wish I'd been there because he was like, like that's my daughter. Like it was apparently like gripping like his mates like arms and stuff like when, when I did go on. So that was you know, that was a really good thing. So yeah, I did bits and pieces with, with a couple of bits with Kate Nash, then another amazing singer called Josephine Onayama. Um, did a few tours with her um, and then met Paloma so that and then that kind of took off like by 2009 we're like yeah all go as it were so yeah so yeah thank god for Mexico if not I'd be a, a really terrible counsellor now probably counselling myself why didn't I do music <laughs> yeah oh, I could yeah I, I was good at uh, well I was I, I could stack five waffles I've got really big hands as you can see and most of the time you'd like you'd kind of grab you could like grab four and put them into the moving belt but I could I could grab five so I'd put four and then carry one over so I was quite the efficient waffle packer I mean, it's a bit different now, I think, because because I'm so very old. We didn't have the internet today. Um, like, I think like, it's different now with YouTube. I mean, actually, there was like YouTube, but you know, it just wasn't as prominent for people. So I think now, like, I think it, it's it's maybe it's a little bit kind of easier in a way to get seen, but maybe it's harder because there's more. Everybody's doing the same thing. But it's a lot easier now to kind of, I guess, like upload videos of yourself playing and although you know that's different to actually being a functioning band member i guess it's just really important to have like a good kind of social media presence i do have an insta but i don't i, like, I don't really use it for lots of personal stuff it is just music i, I like using insta for silly things like i run an account for my mum's dog lord underscore bentlesworth if anyone wants to look yeah, i at, for in terms of like my my social medias I, I generally i do keep it just for music i'm not someone who's like posting constantly about you know food and lunch and whatever um but yeah that it is important because i like the fruit the frank turner gig and recording session came about from facebook basically so he put something just as as well as asking everyone out just a very quick does anyone know any female double bass players and immediately one of my friends who's friends with him 
mentioned me and then his tour manager who also has worked with Paloma mentioned me, done, you know. Then he messaged me, I'm so bad at social media, I don't get back to him for like a day. So there, But he did email me as well. So luckily I do check that every day. I think that's one of the most important things is having that kind of that presence and just and, and the, yeah, just the kind of networking you know I think I think that's easier so it's better to take advantage of it how it was like just like I said about Ladytron like they're sending a CD in the post and you possibly could have like downloaded something but it would have probably taken longer than to actually post the CD so yeah that oh, I feel really old <laughs> uh, <laughs> Just kind of playing for the music and um, and just yeah, just not being ha hung up on on it having to show you off as look at what I can do. Like it's okay to just like play something really simple and just it, it always for me really the most important thing was just having a really good feel over being over playing the complicated things. And I I actually quite enjoy the little variants that you can get from something they like psycho killer in in the way that you it's kind of like you can play like a, a like it's like the long note to short note even though it's just going da, 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 da. so you could go mm, da, mm, like a longer first note maybe a shorter first note da, da. like just tiny little tiny like microscopic little elements like that as well as i've learned this song by funkadelic yeah like i'm so good i've learned tower of power what is hip? Look at this, really fast. Da, 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 da. You know, which is important as well. Bass is a Fender Precision 74. Um, I got it from a person who had basically bought it at the time. And I got that in 2007. Gone all the way to get it. And, and we were just sat in his car. And he, I was like, look, are you sure you want to sell it? And he was like, he was like yeah, I do. And I was like, okay, you sure though? And it's been my pretty much 100% playing all the time bass ever since. I totally love it. I've got a spare bass that I had someone put together with like a jazz neck and a P bass body and it. it's all right, but it's not that. And every, everything else I've played, people who are into like loads of gear always say like, oh, you know, you should try and, you know, get like a music man or, you know, you'd, you'd really like this bass. Do you want to? And I'm like, yeah, it's nice. It's really nice. It's not my base. So it's like I'm, I'm, I'm very, very uh, uh, loyal to, to that. I, I just, I just really like it. I almost didn't. I nearly didn't buy it because uh, I, I didn't want him to regret it. I'd got it on eBay, and he tried to make it active in at some point in the '80s when that was all the rage. So there is like a kind of a, a, a battery size bit carved out of the heel, which you can't see. Because of that, I, it was five hundred pounds, you know, and and he'd resprayed it as well. None of that bothers me. It, it just feels amazing. Um, I've got an orange. Uh, AD 200 um, valve head and an 8x10 <laughs> greedy size amp, which is great. It's a really nice kind of pure sound, a lot like the old Ampeg SVTs, basically. I think they're really similar. I'm, I'm not as keen on the newer Ampegs, and I think I just prefer, I think the orange is actually amazing. Although on the last Paloma tour, because of the stage setup, it was kind of like a bass egg. I can't describe it. Where all the bands are on different platforms and at different, but there's no room aesthetically for an amp, but it would kind of block something on there. It's just not the room. So, which was a bit weird at first. It was kind of like, I just can't do a bloody like arena without, a, without an amp. It's preposterous. Used, um, Sans Amp uh, DI, the, the newer VT. Sounds amazing in my ears, front of house is happy. So everyone's everyone's winning with that. I don't have loads of pedals. I might use a bit of fuzz occasionally. That's basically it. If people are into gear, then I'm just, I'm really boring. <laughs> Fast forward. <laughs> but yeah, I just, I just really, I, I'm just very simple, I think. You know, I'm happy to use whatever effects are necessary, but generally I just find that a nice, clean, pure, lovely, warm bass sound is, is enough, pretty much. 
Paloma is writing her next album at the minute, so it's probably going to be quite a while, but uh, until we go out on tour. But yeah, that will be, um, I guess, probably next year at some point. Maybe that will be great when that happens. In the meantime, we'll just keep doing Faith Etz. Funny story about. Um, oh no, maybe not. It's, it's, it's awful. This is the advice, this is back to the advice actually that I'd give. Always have a tuna on, on a Moog <laughs> or other synths. So basically we did, um, we did New Orleans Jazz Festival, mega, like one on, like that's for me, that was like Glastonbury. They were set up backstage obviously. And then, and, and so before the gig, one of the techs was like, oh Andy, can you just come and check everything's all right? And like we'd loaded all the settings in and that's fine. And I just checked the tune in and I was like, that's out. That's like about a, se a tone or semitone out. So I was like, okay, right, that's cool. Yeah, I'm good, I'm good, fine. Right, I'm gonna go get changed. Go on, get changed, come on stage. It's all being filmed for TV in America, not a big audience or anything. So we start the song and the beginning song is just a band on stage, loads of noise. <laughs> so I'm just fiddling about, making loads of noise. And then drums. <laughs> so I'm playing and I'm like, who's at some, someone is so out. It's so, is it one of the brass? Like who, and I look up and I see like the MDs going like that, like, like, like playing and I'm like, and I'm like oh no it's me and then I'm like trying to tune while it's playing and then he's looking at me and he's going like sharper and I'm like oh god oh god and then I just get and then by this point it's like I think the chorus and I'm like I'm just playing and then for like the next six songs I was like well you've had a good run of it Andy yeah you did well yeah, it's been good, but you know, it's time to, you know, go back to psychology. Here. Yeah, this is this would be my last gig. Yeah, last gig. Like, I was convinced, like, it was just, and luckily, like, that, but you can't see it. Like, I look like I'm having a great time. Internally, I'm basically having the biggest meltdown. So I can't, I've just been out of tune. New Orleans Jazz Festival in front of all these people and all this, it's on camera, it's going to be there forever, it's on TV. Luckily, they don't broadcast the first song winning so uh that i i was i was saved so here i am i'm still going so anyway but what had happened was that the the mood had obviously been switched off after i tuned it backstage then brought it back on and then plugged it in and it had been set a semi somebody had set it to like transpose a semitone down and saved that so that's why it was out of tune <laughs>